Welcome to IMCAST TV, 10 Minutes with Breast Implants. Joining me are Dr. Scott Spear from the United States and Dr. Konstantin Stan from Romania. Uh, both of you are plastic surgeons. Dr. Spear, you are the professor and chairman of the Department of Plastic Surgery at Georgetown Hospital and the past president of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. Um, and I wanted to start with you. My first question is about breast implants, and it's one of the world's most popular surgeries with advances and innovations and unfortunately scandals, uh, as we saw this morning with the PIP. But these innovations are coming at in an incredibly fast pace from all over the world. And I was just reading a recent um, International Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons survey, which ranked the US first among countries performing breast augmentations. Today, can we consider a mammary implant a sure thing? Uh, have we diminished the problems? So uh, <coughs> the short answer to that is there's no sure things in anything in life. Surgery so there, is surgery. There are no sure things, uh, but I think it's certainly become much more predictable and much safer than it was 5, 10, 15, or 25 years ago. Um, so that the, the, data sh the data for me is that 90% or more of women who have a breast augmentation procedure are probably going to be happy with their surgery, and that even 10 years later, 90% of those women are still going to be happy with their surgery. So when you think about all the other things in life and health, I think it's, uh, it fits within the, a safe profile. It's why the FDA and other agencies around the world have approved these implants, and mm -hmm. I'm comfortable offering them, offering them to my patients with a high, high likelihood that they're going to be just fine. Just fine. And Dr. Stan, can you talk about the latest innovations in mammary augmentation? I know you're at the forefront of a new family of breast implants called FORT2. Can you, can you tell us about that? Well, um, you ask about innovation. Yes, thank God here, but actually outside of the United States where 50 years ago, the first breast implant, actually it was January 1963, the first breast augmentation in Texas. Now we are 50 years after, and uh, still we have a lot of innovation. And we had the chance in Europe and uh, other countries in the world, having companies who are really moving on research, the chance to use new generation of the implant, talking about more similar to the normal tissue. Right. I'm talking about the consistency, mm. which are really more connected and close to the normal parenchyma of the women, manipulating less the tissue, new surface of the shell to give more stability and mm -hmm. less complication rate. And I had also the chance to work with German and Brazilian company and developing of these things. And now, I'm very happy, and Dr. Scott Spear now, that after years, a new American company is able to introduce this new generation of implant, probably except the surface, the polyurethane. But I know that about 20 years ago, because before the moratorium, you've been very happy with the polyurethane surface, no? What do you think? Uh, well, Dr. Stan's talking about the, this device, which is uh, made in Brazil by Silamed. And uh, a similar company called Cientra now is in marketing, making that uh, yeah. device So in this the US. is also available in the United States. Except for the polyurethane for covering. For the surface. Except yeah. for the and surface. And what's happened is the polyurethane is, uh, is a totally different kind of surface than the other breast implants because it's not silicone, it's polyurethane. Yeah. And it's evolved uh, since the original ones back in the uh, 70s and 80s. Uh, so that's probably a better medical grade. It probably is adherent to the implant in a better way than the Safer. ones used to be. So I think it's a... It's uh, like everything else in life, a new and improved version of what has been but, uh, worked on over the Actually, life. for the people looking to our uh, <laughs> TV show, the, the women can touch this. Uh, there is a word for the Brazilian uh, implant. It's called Brazilian furs. And for the German Polytech company doing the same surface, it's called German velvet. Yes. In terms of really well, how I they I really act it's with it's the tissue. The, the, yes. the texture is almost like a, a peach. Please, touch it. Uh, you are as a woman. Do you peach. prefer... Peach fuzz, uh, yes, I guess yes, you would yes. call it. And Dr. touch it, this. It's a very, very... Yeah, it very is very... And gentle. Look. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, 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 w oh. I would just only say this, though, that about every device, uh, how it is in your hand is one thing, but and how it behaves in the body in the over body three or five or ten years body. is another. And we hope that this device is just as favorable in the body as it is in... But I had the chance in the last four years to use exclusively this device you because... You exclusively. In my exclusively. practice. In my practice. Because when I start something, it's like in the life. If I start to be married with a woman, I would I want at least for uh, for years. ten years. 
but it's not possible 10 years to use the same, not a woman, the same implant. Great. And, and are there important risks and dangers in silicone leaks? And what can go wrong and what are the consequences? Well, I think, I think the issue regarding safety is that the good news is that for most of the things we worry about, the risk is very low. So, for example, we know, not for this device specifically, but for, for most of the modern gel devices, the risk of the implant breaking is probably 5 to 7% over 10 years. Which yeah. is a, so we know that. And then we know that if the implants break, the risk of it causing any significant problem right. is also low, lower than that 5 or 7%. Yeah. So it gets to be a very small number of women where we really worry about anything serious happening. But there is always going to be one patient in 100,000 or one patient in 10,000 or one patient in a million where something unusual happens. So we can't tell you that it never happens. No. But you, you spoke about the moratoriums, and I want to go back to the FDA moratoriums. Have they slowed the research and development in the United States? Europe, you're going at a very, very fast pace. Um, do you feel that that has really hindered the Probably Dr. Spear can talk more about yeah. this, but the same American companies, we are in the States, stopped the development of the new devices in Europe, all over the world. The same R&D department are worked very hardly to develop, and we had the chance really to try it uh, in Europe, all over the world. If, but do you feel like the, the brakes have been put on to American uh, development? In, in there, there is the no implant? question that the progress in the United States has been slowed down. The, the FDA the United States has its pluses and minuses. It's very focused on safety and not so focused on advancements, so that they're very risk adverse, uh, frankly, in the FDA. The uh, European environment is a little bit more favorable to trying new things based upon levels of evidence. The FDA requires higher levels of evidence. Frankly, you could even argue that the U US FDA uses Europe as sort of a laboratory right. before it the decides it wants to approve right. something, let mm -hmm. it be tried in Europe first. But, but honestly speaking, when I'm talking with the patient about, for example, the risk of implant rupture, I'm telling my patient, it's higher risk to broken her marriage than to have the rupture <laughs> of the implant in the next 10 years. Well, I that think it depends on the patient <laughs> you're talking patient. to. Yes. Yes, he's absolutely. talking statistics, and he's probably right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Now, now, silicone versus saline, what are your... Silicone versus saline. <laughs> Can I start you? Yeah, you start. Yes, because I had the chance to not use saline implants. Can you imagine a woman having inside a, a bag of water? But the American was obliged at that moment to survive. It was a question to survive. And then they discovered that an, this implant initially was invented somewhere in Europe with saline. And then the American company found a way to produce it. Yeah, I, I would just say this. When patients... Uh, very few of my patients want saline implants in the United States. Um, around the world, uh, it varies from country to country. I, I always tell patients the safest device in terms of if you're worried about the device is a saline filled implant because it's a balloon full of water. But in terms of the performance of the device and in terms of local tissue complications, the silicone implants are better. Are better. So that I would say in my practice, less than one patient in maybe 100 chooses a saline implant. Sailing. Oh, well, that's huge. But for sure, for American, it's inconvenient truth to accept the that saline truth. implants, from my point of view, regarding my experience and the way of seeing the results of our colleagues, destroyed more women tissue breast than silicone implants in the last 15 years because the tissue alteration, the atrophy of the ribs, and the tissue, the skin patient on long term, I'm talking about 10 years, I think this destroy more breasts than silicon before. I, I, I just, I, I just, we have one minute and I want to get one question in before we, we stop. And I, it's about the international control so a global PIP scandal doesn't occur again. Uh, how can we avoid that? Well, I can tell you this, there is no international control, period. Sh I mean, there should be. Well, it, we don't have international control over anything else, so I, I, I don't know how we're going to get international control over breast implants. Yeah. But what is happening uh, in the U.S. and may happen also in Europe is a registry where we look at uh, events, and so we can track events on patients over the long term. The PIP thing was, it was really an example of a company not following the rules, which can happen anywhere until they mm -hmm. get caught. Yeah. So it could happen anywhere. It anytime. was a small company, a small laboratory, if you want, and uh, then the, the failure of the local authority in controlling things. That means yeah. FDA plus and minus, we need to appreciate a lot what FDA have done and will be done in the future. Thank you both for joining me. This was 
very, very interesting and, and educational. Thank you so much. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you welcome. for having us. And uh, why stop? I would love to keep <laughs> going. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.